We'd like to cover uh, a couple of issues um, <coughs> before we get in the regular agenda, just as a part of uh, the review that we've been doing. <coughs> One of which is the, the schedule of these meetings and this, uh, the shift in venue and um, how that might affect us going forward. And we talked previously about the, uh, not only the frequency of these meetings, but the possibility of starting earlier, which we're doing this morning, and in some cases going later to get the work done, and the possibility of having some subcommittees created to accommodate some of the work. And that will, the need for that probably will become more obvious as we, uh, as we get further into the agenda. But we would appreciate your um, uh, thinking through those issues with us in order to be sure that we uh, do enough work to make an informed recommendation to the mayor and council uh, when we ultimately deliver it. We, uh, we appreciate the effort all of you have made to continue to attend these meetings and to do the airport tour. Um, as some of you know, I am out of the city most of the time. <laughs> And when, when we were assigned to this commission, um, I had no Tuesdays in town from the day we were appointed until now. So thanks to my assistant and my clients, we've had great success up until today modifying that schedule. But beginning at the next meeting and literally for the next four meetings, I won't be uh, here with you. And, um, Dave and I have been trying to manage that. I will be working with him between meetings, but I found that those commitments that were in place were more concrete than the ones we have just modified in the last few months. And so we will, we, we've been hoping to get um, uh, a little more of an advanced schedule out so you know what to anticipate. And we continue to work with Jay and the rest of the staff on that, and we will hope to be better about that in, in the weeks that, uh, are ahead of us. We also have <clears throat> a, a couple of issues that we've been working on that we've, we've mentioned in passing in previous meetings, but we've been doing more work between meetings to accomplish these tasks, and, and, and Dave and I will give a little report on that this morning. The first of the, the, what I'd like to report on is that we have continued to receive lots of proposals from some of you here in this room and many outside the room about what, quote, the solution, unquote, for the new airport or the revised or the remodeled airport might be. Uh, also, some a separate series of recommendations about how to conduct this business and how to hear from the community um, to be sure that everyone, that it is an open process and everyone is heard. And so, um, we have been working with staff and others, ex experts outside of staff, to be sure that we are accomplishing those important tasks. And uh, in the last few weeks in particular, we, uh, we've made some significant progress. I was hoping I was going to be announcing this morning um, when we would be launching the revised website and the new uh, tools that we will be employing in terms of social media to make this a community-wide conversation. Uh, the city, um, Danny Rodert and Ashley Hand, uh, have been taking the lead working with Jay and using some outside experts and communications to do that. But our intention is, in the not too distant future, and certainly before we get to our deliberation, to launch uh, a much friendlier website that that invites real dialogue and allows people to uh, launch their ideas and allows the community to engage in a collective dialogue to explore them and vet them uh, without a lot of input from us. And that will, we think, inform our process and allow everyone in the community to know that they can be heard and that people are listening and looking and responding to their best ideas. And we found in a variety of other communities that are confronting issues like this that can be very helpful and informative and create a greater sense of community as we move toward making a critical decision about the future at KCI. Um, are there any questions about that before we move to the next? 
issue? Or Jay, do you have anything you'd like to add to no. that part? Okay. I might get it, Ed. I, I would, uh, uh, you know, thank m many of you on this committee and many of you uh, out in the gallery have uh, made that suggestion uh, about engaging in using current social media. Uh, and we, we have listened to that. We appreciate that suggestion. And we are moving forward on that, uh, as Bob has elaborated. So again, we, we really appreciate the, the suggestions that, that all of you are making. Uh, and, and we intend to be very nimble uh, and, and add these enhancements and, and make other modifications as we go along. So if there are no more questions on that, maybe uh, the consultant team report. you want to give a brief report on that? Okay. Um, we, we continue to deliberate uh, on a, uh, an, an outside consultant who would provide us uh, additional expertise and uh, access to resources. Uh, and we are in discussions uh, with the mayor's office about funding for that. And uh, uh, we expect to go through a, uh, a brief RFP process around uh, selecting a, a consultant to provide that type of data. So we're looking for uh, a consultant who will have uh, a regular working knowledge already. They won't have to recreate the wheel, have regular working knowledge about uh, airport uh, design, airport demographics, uh, and the like, uh, because we'll need access to that information on other airport experiences in terms of shape, size, service <laughs> population, uh, financial, ramifications, uh, revenue, before and after airport modifications, all those things. We we'll look for a consultant that will be able to provide that information that has a regular working knowledge of that. And so uh, we'll be launching that process very soon to get that, uh, get that consultant on board and who will be able to advise us. Questions? Are there local people that can do that, or are we looking, how broad are we looking for someone? Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I think there are people in this community that have some knowledge in that area, uh, Bill, but we are, we are looking for the best experts wherever they happen to be. And <clears throat> part of the, there are sort of two components that Dave and I focused on. One is <clears throat> to be sure that we are taking an independent look at this issue and that we are advised outside of aviation department and their consultants just to be sure and assure the community that we've really given us a rigorous look and two to have to for us to be informed by the best information available at other airports and whatever city is having success addressing the same issues we find need to be addressed here Yes. And I assume this will be different from what was just completed, that, um, you know, the City Council had the whole presentation from the, the consultants that the Aviation Department um, had had. I just don't want to see us um, spending additional money for, for what was maybe already done, or will the RFB be considerably different? Uh, I can address, we're, we're not going to uh, undertake an expense to recreate the wheel because that would take uh, too long. It would take months, you know, a year to, to go and, and start over and build a spreadsheet and all that. So this consultant will uh, be different than anyone that's been working on it already. And, and they will uh, study what's already been done and give us input but will not recreate the wheel. Um, that would not be efficient use of our scarce resources. Yes. Yes, I'm curious at the time frame, if you're, if we're just now going after uh, go, looking at that, 
you know, what, what are you thinking the time frame for uh, bringing back that information would be? Well, the, the time frame for getting the consultant on board is really our only issue, and then the, con the consultant will begin contributing immediately. So we're not going to hire a consultant and have them go away for a month and come back and give us some grandiose grand plan. The consultant will start advising us and, and uh, uh, we'll be able to critique what's already been done in pretty short order and then provide the demographics we need. Um, our issue uh, on a time frame to this point has been uh, resolving Funding, funding issues, and and uh, not for <clears throat> lack of discussion, but I think it's going to be uh, a pretty short time frame to get up to speed, and then this individual or individuals will be able to contribute right away. Um, but I think being realistic about it, um, our task for not driven for that reason, but just for the complexity of this whole area and issue around the airport will probably take us beyond the end of the year. I think that's uh, Bob and I are realists and um, so our deliberations will probably extend beyond December. Uh, you've raised I think a couple of both of you uh, important points and I want to be clear that we didn't just start looking for consultants. Uh, this was a conversation that was held in the first week after we were appointed. And the delay has been all about what is the appropriate way to fund it. And so there, there are a number of options available, uh, one of which is the business community funds it. And there, there have been conversations about that through the Civic Council or the Chamber. But that leads to the possibility that the community would think this has been hardwired and driven by either city hall or business. And so it seemed important again that if we, <clears throat> that we have a consultant, they are engaged in such a way that there's no bias in their analysis. And so that's taken considerable time. Jay's been working with us. Uh, the manager's been working with us. And we have a meeting next Wednesday, I believe, in the manager's office to get this resolved. And to be, and then to move efficiently in this direction. I was trying to be more subtle than that, but Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for clarifying. <laughs> so, if there are no other questions in that area, um, let's let's move back to the first um, item on the agenda to uh, listen to your observations about the airport tour. Uh, as you know, Channel 2 was with us, uh, trying to document what we were seeing to make that available to those that couldn't be there and those in the larger community. Unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason, the cameras or something that were being used that day uh, gave us um, electronic file that's not real useful. We would have been looking at some of the highlights today. Jay has given you in his packet, in your packet, a few images that he took with his phone while we're there, just as a reminder uh, of what we saw. But what, what we would like to do now is have, give you a chance to give us a little feedback since we didn't have the conversation there. What, what did you learn? And what did we learn collectively by that visit? Uh, and, and let's try, as we have in the other areas that we've reviewed, reduce that to a few key learnings that we can document moving forward. So I'll allow you, in whatever order you like, to begin sharing your thoughts about that. Sure. I will, I will just start it by saying I, I think that, like everything, there's a lot more complexities to things than what meets the eye originally. And, and I think some of these pictures are really kind of some of the things that are stuck in my mind that it, would rem it reminded me of house hunting and when you go into an empty home and you, get your, you go down to the basement and you start looking at issues that would make you choose to buy the home or not to buy the home. 
And so there were, there were just a lot of things there that surprised me that, um, that it had aged more than what I had expected in my mind when I, when I went on the tour. It certainly had aged more than I had during the same period. I noticed <laughs> that. Uh, uh, certainly the case. Anyone else? Good morning. Um, I guess two key observations for me. Um, I took note of the same complexities that you spoke of. Um, with the building maintenance and it being dilapidated in certain areas, I, it begs the question for me, some of that is just normal wear and tear when things haven't been taken care of um, or fixed, um, normal deterioration, but does that lend to the case for consolidation into a single terminal? You know, to me, I, that's separate from fixing repairs than the issue of consolidating the terminals. So I draw a distinction there. They don't go together to me. Um, the other issue, though, is more of the airline-facing challenges. I noticed that, I think it was brought up that when planes are backing out, um, there's not a lot of space between the terminals and um, certain airlines are having to wait until another airline takes off or backs out, pushes back. And whatever the um, safety issues are there, um, don't know if that has any regulatory implications in terms of um, the size between terminals, um, in terms of um, pushing back, taking off, all of that. So I, those are my two key, you know, findings or understandings from our, um, from our visit. And the first one, I just don't know if all the, don't want to use the word hype, that's the only thing that's coming to mind, <laughs> sorry, um, about the repairs lend to a single terminal. So I'd like us to really be thoughtful about that. Yeah, good points. Anyone else? Um, so if, I think my primary observation, and also uh, caused me to, I think, reprioritize some of the things we put in the spreadsheet, at least in my mind, was the uh, adaptability and flexibility aspect of a lot of the things they were calling out, the uh, cement structure of the terminal itself, and the really inflexibility to modify that or change that. It's not construction constructed to be any more load-bearing, right, to add another story on, for example. Um, because it is concrete, it's very hard to expand into um, other areas, also the bandwidth of the room that's available both on the air side as well as the road side. And then I think the other, um, the other thing that was a surprise to me was the limitations that the way that the jet bridges were built, that those present, right? It's not just purely, um, it's a cost issue. Um, it's also a business development issue in that they're not able to bring some of the international flights, some of the newer planes into the airport without, you know, um, you know, serious either costs or inconvenience to the airline or the, uh, the airport staff. Um, so that flexibility, adaptability aspect, I think, was really, really brought forward. And then um, in terms of the single terminal, um, you know, multiple terminal aspect, uh, one thought I had after thinking through, right, trying to separate through the issues of really what's a single terminal issue versus multi-terminal issues and some of those considerations, and reflecting back on many of the airports that I've visited, um, a lot of them have physically separate buildings, even though they may have a single security entrance or access. Um, a lot of them do actually, St. Louis, great example, right? They have, they have two terminals. So I, I don't know necessarily if some of the multiple infrastructure um, uh, conversations and concerns are necessarily going to be solved by a single access point from a security standpoint because it seems like there's a lot of airport structures that do contain multiple buildings that I'm sure have the same things that we have with multiple um, IT data centers, uh, with multiple, you know, chillers and the related um, heating and cooling infrastructure, right? They, there's multiple airports and I feel have the same things. So I, I also separate, right, the fact that they need to maintain and do those things and fix those things and update those things with the decision. I think there is some separation there as well, just kind of reflecting on how some of the other airports are considered um, configured and the similar issues that they must, they must encounter. Great comments. John. 
First of all, I apologize for being late, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I would agree with just some of the same observations. <clears throat> I, I guess the one thing that, uh, that stood in my mind and would like more information and maybe that was discussed earlier is um, the uh, international business that we are currently doing at KCI and what is the potential and what does that equate to in terms of uh, potential revenue because from what I remember hearing is that we have 300 individuals a day that are flying to Europe. Um, I'm also hearing that <clears throat> there's a, a greater need to, to have more flights going to Mexico but because of the international uh, requirements of the inspection and having to build that out and, and adding to some of those issues, um, we're not able to do that. So for me, just having a little bit more information about what is the, the lost uh, business uh, by not having the accommodations to uh, <clears throat> support more international travel. Uh, but it was also interesting in some of the things that I heard too is how the planes as they're getting bigger require different accommodations. And then I think I remember hearing that is, as the planes, you know, um, were hanging over the runway, that created some violations. And then it just seemed like any new accommodations to come requires that we build out. And as we build out, that impacts that, uh, that space. So uh, again, those were my comments. But I did enjoy uh, the overall tour. I thought that was very beneficial. Thanks. Anyone else? Bob. Yes. Um, I learned a new term on, on the tour, and it's not one that I think we should hear, and that's interior gutter. Um, a gutter doesn't belong on the interior, and, and there's a picture in the packet about that. It was pretty ingenious, you know, the, um, how they um, retrofitted um, a trough to catch the water and send it to the appropriate place um, to get it to the drain as opposed to just sitting on the concrete. But I still believe interior gutter is, an, is not a term we should be using. Um, the other thing is... Um, the range of responses um, to the tour. You know, I, I, um, the shifting walls, I, I think, are a concern. Others would, would say that it's um, just part of being a 40-year-old structure. And although I do understand that maintenance, um, the maintenance issues are separate from a single terminal issue, um, I do think it still all boils down to cost and is the cost of maintaining and bringing, um, getting rid of interior gutters, um, I think there's a cost piece that we really have to look at to know um, what is best for the airport. Great. Yes, hey, I may add to that as well. I was struck by um, really when you talk to the maintenance folks at the airport to appreciate the fact that they are spending a remarkable amount of time cobbling together systems to keep the facility moving forward and doing what it's supposed to do. And so it, it was surprising to know that there are all those mechanical rooms in the basement, that they all have their sort of separate spaces and they're different, they're, they're self-contained, they don't relate to the other mechanical rooms. If one goes down, there's not really a way to link those together. So to Kiana's point, I think it is worth thinking about what does that all mean? How do you, sorry, what does that all mean uh, in terms of figuring out how to address some of those subsurface infrastructure issues and how does that dot connect to the broader issue of whether we need more. Because I'll be honest, I picked up my kids at the end of the summer uh, a month ago and my wife, a very busy traveler, loved the fact that it was she could set up the Starbucks and wait for the kids to get off the plane and it was just easy to go grab them. And so there's this idea that we're almost a victim of our own success because that multi-million dollar retrofit 10 years ago under Kay Barnes has got that top level looking fabulous, but I don't think people appreciate the fact that it, it's falling apart around that, that great piece right there. So I just think we need to kind of keep drilling down on that and trying to figure out what that actually means and, um, and whether that's going to be sustainable. Even, even if, we, if we do nothing, um, how are you able to sustain servicing three or four mechanical rooms per terminal um, and, and make that work for airlines? And then the other point I'll bring up, then I'll yield the floor, is um, it is surprising to me as well when we went into that new terminal that's being built out for I forget which airline that was empty at the time, um, we really have not heard from the airlines. And I know that's going to be a piece that we're going to visit at some point, but it seems to me that when, and that ties into everything from adaptability to the bump outs on the concourse, 
what exactly are airlines looking for? What do what are they saying that they need? And I'm not saying that um, that this commission should demand a a promise that if we do what they want, they're going to come in. But at least give us a sense of really what's your ideal situation, and we can say we can't do it, or we can say we can work with you and meet you in the middle. So, good points, Dan. Um, and we should say that we are. They are on the agenda, so okay. we will hear from the airlines, and we have heard from some in writing already. So, um, yes, Joe. Good morning. Um, I really lo loved the tour, and I guess I had some of the same thoughts that Dan did. Uh, first of all, I was just terribly impressed with the people that make the airport run. I mean, I wish that er our whole public could see what goes on behind the scenes while we saw all the structural issues, the dedication that was there, the coordination, the professionalism was really great, sort of made you feel proud about your city to know all that's going on. You know, you've got, I know we've got guys that wake up in the middle of the night and they're worried about making sure the airport's going to run tomorrow, which is really fantastic. Um, and I, I hope I don't s step on anyone's toes, but I just, as I was walking through and looking at it, um, one of the things I keep coming back to is Kemper Arena. And, uh, you know, Kemper Arena, uh, I grew up in Kemper Arena, all of you know it, and it got to the point where something had to be done at Kemper Arena. Uh, and we did it. Um, the city did it. And it kind of got us through. We spent a lot of money, in my opinion. And it kind of got us through. But then when we decided we wanted to be something different when we grew up, now Kemper Arena is there and it's underutilized at best. And we have a wonderful Sprint Center. And so I'm trying to figure that balance out. I, I really think that um, some of this comes down to it, it, there is no doubt in my mind that we could spend the money and the talents there to upgrade this thing and fix the problems. We could do it. Um, but does that get us to where we want to be? Is that really what we want from the airport? I, because it's, I think that's what it comes down to, and it does come down to a value thing, as Dan said. If we put the money in today, in 10 years, are we going to be happy with what we have? Or will the state of the art and all the rest of it have passed us by, and all of a sudden it's Kemper Arena, and we're going to build Sprint? And I love Sprint, and I loved Kemper. But I think that's sort of, to me, that's what I'm, I say this in a positive way, not a negative way, that's what I'm struggling with, which is you can get this done. We can spend the money to fix the problems. Um, but does that get us to where we need to be? And um, I think when I went through the airport, it didn't help me get to that answer, but it convinced me we could fix it if we needed to. A, a couple, a couple thoughts. Um, uh, first of all, for the record, that this this committee is is not going to take on the issue of Kemper Arena. <laughs> I, I want to make that clear. That's that's a separate that's a separate group is working on that. But uh, um, but I, I think it's a good analogy. Uh, um, but I, and I and I think we will we will get to uh, and on future meetings, um, Joe, the the concept of uh, length of you know, what a renovation gets us, are we kicking the can down the road, or what's the ROI? So we definitely will, will uh, be addressing that, no, no doubt about it. Um, and I think the other, the other thoughts about, um, that I've heard about the electrical and, and uh, that you were making, Dan, on around the, uh, what happens if part of that goes out, what do we do? And the airports in a little, uh, little different uh, scenario, as we noted at one of our recent meetings, that the airport needs to anticipate repairs to always be able to run 24/7, whereas many other venues can wait for something to break and then fix it. But the airport has to be in front of that. So if they're making changes or renovations or improvements or, or maintenance changes. People say, well, Jai, it shouldn't be time to do that. Well, the airport, we learned uh, from the airport officials uh, that they, they can't wait for that. So they maybe are always a little ahead of the game on that. I can't resist. I'm not trying to dwell on Kemper Arena, but this is how I remember Kemper Arena. We needed more seats to keep the Big 12 tournament here. We figured out how to put more seats in Kemper Arena, but then we found out that Lady Gaga wouldn't play there and so we had to build Sprint. And I sort of keep on coming back to that in this way, which is, okay, we can sort of fix what we've got today, but in five years, does it mean that we can't get the thing to Mexico? Well, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but it's the Lady Gaga of the future, 
relative to the airport to me. So just for the record, sir, you are, if we get Lady Gaga to play at the airport, <laughs> I just need to make sure I'm getting this correct. <laughs> Bill. You know, I think Joe's right. We could fix the place, but the fix might cost as much as it would to build what would be new and state of the art. And in five years, the fix could very well be out of date. So uh, I think we ought to get over the fix and move ahead to try to build something that's state of the art that works, that we're not continually maintaining. It's like an old house. You can restore an old house, spend a ton of money on it. And you still got an old house that you're working on all the time. So that's the way I look at this, trying to repair the thing and just keep it up. We need to. Got a couple more comments. We, we ready? Yeah. <laughs> um, although I enjoyed it, um, and I'm glad that you, you said that about the repairs and things like that, that did come up. What is the cost to repair if we were to repair everything? Because during a tour, we only saw Terminal A. Terminal A, we know, has the most problems. Um, I don't know what the comparison would be to B or C, but no matter if we build new or if we repair, there's going to have to be some type of maintenance to it. So what is the cost to, if we just were to fix everything mechanical, um, utility-wise, because that's what it sounded like was a great need right now, was a mechanical and a utility. And then there were other needs as far as parking and um, there may have been some security concerns here and there, but what would be the cost if we were to fix everything because we don't know what that is, whether it would be higher or lower, just like we don't know with this $1.2 billion, we don't know if it's actually going to cost that, whether it be more or less. So we don't have the numbers to make that, that good judgment on. But it, it did cause me to ask a lot of questions, and I'll bring up more later, but uh, good tour. Yes. I had one other comment, and um, personally, I'm going to try really hard not to ever complain about baggage again, because when you see that downstairs and you know, if, if it does one thing, it goes this direction, and if it does something else, it goes that direction, and then there's still the human error that somebody actually still picks up the bag and puts it on the right cart. So um, personally, I'm not going to complain about baggage anymore. Okay. Yes. You know, the, the other observation that I had that I was kind of taken back with, and I know technology has changed a lot in 40 years, and, and the airport, they have tried, had to retrofit all those changes, and that will continue. I understand that. But I guess I was taken back with how small all of the things were that were handled, their IT was. I mean, it, I guess I expected a huge room that, that it would all be networked, you know, to all the other terminals, and I'm sure it is, but the, it's, it just seemed like it was very, very small to do all the things that we rely on it to do. And I, I was just kind of taken back with that. It didn't seem that it, was, um, that it was as massive as I thought it would be with technology the way it is. Oh, yes, Kevin. I just want to echo what, what Joe said. I was terribly impressed by how well and how professional uh, the staff was. I mean, frankly, I was somewhat afraid that, you know, we were going to be walking into something that looked like a, you know, a bomb zone or, a, you know, they'd been, they'd been all torn up, but it looked more like they were preparing for an FAA inspection or something. It was uh, uh, very impressed, and I agree, the dedication there, uh, what they demonstrate on a day-in, day-out basis to keep the thing you know, operating is, is worth calling out. Uh, I was also appreciated, you know, their candor and their honesty. Uh, when we found a couple of things, there was one uh, leak in particular that was staining a hallway, and they said, yeah, we could fix this and take about three hours, but we'd have to shut, you know, the terminal down overnight, and if we ever get to a point where we feel like it's worth it, you know, we'll do it, but right now it's just kind of like, you know, the leaky ceiling with the bucket, you know, under it. So I appreciated that. Uh, one other comment that may have even just gone flying by because I haven't heard anybody else mention it yet, but when we were in the, uh, the buses pr or the, the bus prior to going into the terminal and we're going around, there was a comment made that the, uh, they had been soliciting service from Allegiant Airways and that we'd been unable to accommodate them because of their gate requests. And I did some follow-up with that because I was curious, since obviously when you drive by, you see a lot of empty gates, and so I want to understand you know, better about that. They were looking for a, a, uh, an arrangement completely different from uh, how our lease contracts 
are set up, so we were unable to accommodate them, not so much from a physical structure, but more from how our current lease uh, arrangements are set up. But there was uh, another assumption, I think, that was made that might have been taken out of context, and that was that because we could not accommodate them uh, with a gate, they now fly to Branson and to Wichita and to Des Moines, which, again, to me seemed like a little bit extreme just because we couldn't you know, give them a gate. So I, I did a little bit of research and found that actually their business model is to service those underserved, non-competitive markets where they can fly an, a, an A320 into Des Moines every three or four days, fill it up and take them to, to Florida or to Vegas or to Phoenix or whatever. So, um, they, for example, they fly into Colorado Springs instead of Denver. They fly into Belleville, Illinois instead of St. Louis. So they're looking, they even fly into Grand Island instead of Omaha. Uh, but they don't fly in any major markets. And in fact, if Kansas City had been able to land that, we would have been the largest non-destination airport in their entire system. So I just wanted to, to make sure everybody understood that in context. Thanks. So uh, it sounds like it was worth taking the tour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, w I, uh, I ended up with a page of um, observations about the airport. And, and as you all know, I, I knew, probably knew more about it having been involved in the design and, and watched it all these years, but I have not been back below the main level in all that time. And, and so um, I tried to reduce all those to three key learnings, and listening to all of you, I real, and, and I had difficulty reducing my list to three key learnings, but now listening to you, I'm even, I have an even greater sense of how inadequate my three were, but I'm going to share them anyway because of this perspective of having seen it over this period of time. The first is, and compliments to the Aviation Department, which has been made before, but I want to reinforce that. I, I found it remarkable uh, how they had accommodated the degree of change they have experienced within the physical confines of that infrastructure and terminal system. Uh, I think uh, they have done an extraordinary job of honoring the original concept, which was to make that airport as convenient for us, local folks, using it as humanly possible and maybe the best in America. Uh, and they have honored that with extraordinary changes in security, in lifestyles, in retail, all of those things, in aircraft sizes, in operation, in environmental changes. And, and so, first of all, kudos to everyone that's made that possible. Um, I think, um, so that, that was, for me, one of the three. Um, and frankly, some of the things that we have referred to generally as, as deferred maintenance and so on takes on a whole new um, perspective, I believe, when we recognize that um, the only way some of those things can be addressed is to literally shut it down. <laughs> and that hasn't been an option. And so a lot of the things we saw can only be repaired if you take a terminal out of operation. You can't take it a piece of a terminal at a time when you're talking about infrastructure. If it is the water main or the sewer main or the gas main, that terminal is down when you start addressing those issues. And for me, that was a, a sort of a remarkable uh, revelation. The, the second was that in spite of that ingenuity, the, the expense of continuing to use those techniques is increasing per whatever you want to say, passenger problem, whatever, and the success in achieving that original goal is less and less impressive. <laughs> Uh, as the aircraft get larger, as the security demands increase, as, you know, as you all saw, the first thing to accommodate some of these things was to do the 15-foot bump out. That helped, but it diminished the space on the ramp. Then in some areas, in addition to the 15 feet, came another 15 feet was the gerbil tube connecting the 15-foot bump outs. That took even more space. 
Then, when security can no longer be contained by the terminal, that took additional bump outs. Each of those bump outs interferes with aircraft handling capacity, and each of those causes a plane to park further and further and further from its original footprint, interfering with the movement of aircraft throughout the terminal complex and finding their way to the taxiways. Um, th th at this point, in some cases, at best, you could say they're, they're evaluating <coughs> diminishing returns on those investments, and in some cases, there's just no successful way out without some kind of significant change in the configuration of both infrastructure and terminal. And for me, that was a huge uh, uh, revelation. Alicia, Alicia talked about uh, learning this new term, interior gutter. And for me, uh, it made me think about a term that we all use all the time in a different way, and that's bandwidth. You know, in this case, so it's the width of that terminal. And when we looked at the new security system that now they're preparing to install for the next airline shift, uh, really, there is no space. If you put that system in, there is no space left for the gate holder. There's just enough for the system and a little uh, corridor to get by that security area. So where do the people then wait for their plane? Um, and so it, 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 all of that in aggregate um, left me with a new appreciation for the depth of the problem. Uh, and I think uh, I'm at this point, I, I think several points have been made about, well, all these issues don't necessarily lead to a new single terminal. And, and, uh, and, and, and some have said, well, maybe we do need to make that leap. I, for one, don't yet know. What I do know is we literally have to shut down things at a terminal at a time to deal with these issues, and, and some significant change is going to have to happen. What that exactly is, I don't know. And I do think many of you have mentioned that there are a lot of questions yet to be answered. And so we think, Dave and I think, our collective job is to be sure we understand what all those issues are and be sure we have collected the best information available to fill those blanks and then we might move in the direction of being equipped to have uh, a real dialogue or deliberation about what our recommendation to the city should be. So that's kind of the path uh, we're on at this point. Um, maybe it's, we, the, the questionnaire that we thank you for almost all of you taking the time and energy to fill it out and, and we recognize that uh, our individual perspective sometimes made it a little difficult to answer some of those because you can interpret them differently. But uh, we think that was a really worth your time. And we also think, and Dave will be reporting in a minute, uh, that the results of our collective thinking on those issues will lead us to securing the right information to make an informed decision. And so now we'd like to shift, if we could, to the survey that you did and uh, what we think it begins to tell us. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, before we do that, I, I want to just touch on a couple of things you said, um, uh, share my perspectives as well, and then kind of throw out a couple of ideas to the group. Um, I think probably the uh, uh, the most striking to me was what Bob said that I want to highlight is, is that within each terminal there are like five stations that fund electricity and handle everything throughout that specific terminal and it is not possible. We learned at a prior meeting about the uh, if, if one of those stations goes out or they're going to repair something, that's, that becomes the a piece of pie approach, the terminal. It just wouldn't work in trying to shut that down uh, and, and have traffic flow and everything. And uh, I was struck by that. Um, and the only way to do anything is to do it, as Bob indicated, uh, one terminal at a time. And um, uh, that, that was probably the most striking thing to me. And, and, and then throw on top of that, you have to anticipate that and do it before something goes out. 
uh, makes it even more challenging. The other thing I would suggest the group when we, we talked about what is the cost of making these changes, we, we are going to get into that at one of our uh, uh, next meetings, and uh, that, that is important. And, and so what I ask this committee to, to focus on um, in any future dialogues you have outside these meetings is that I, I'm beginning to have the point of view that, uh, that we, we need to get off uh, a, a $1.2 billion price tag as all or nothing. It, we, when, when you see things written or people talk about, well, why are we spending 1.2? It's, so it's, the question is not zero or 1.2 billion, it's some number. And so I would like to have us get off of referring to any dollar amounts at this time uh, in, in, in any future deliberations we have until we have better information. So to talk about um, the question being zero, 1.2 billion is not productive. And so that's my request to this group. If we uh, unify around that, that the, there is no cost number um, and that, that's not what we're here to debate. We're, we're here to debate what's an efficient use of scarce resources and, and I would expect that it's something less than 1.2 billion um, is my guess, but, but let's, let's get off of that. And the other th suggestion I have is that because it's been overused and become a, a negative, I would also ask that until we have better information that we not uh, use the term uh, single terminal to be referred to everything that's bad or the multiple terminals to refer to everything that's good and, and maybe it ends up being a combination. So until we put a label on that, um, there may be some aspects to an airport, e even uh, some of the ideas we've read about that have, what, what about keeping all three terminals but having a central security point and then people fan out? Well, is that a single terminal or is that a multiple terminal? I, I don't know. And, and so I think we maybe confuse the issue if we refer to a single terminal as a uh, specific concept yet until we get further into it. So I, I would ask that we try to refrain from using that term and, and uh, uh, figure out more descriptive ways to refer to a centralized baggage or a centralized security because uh, airports, I'm not sure I could tell uh, if I was blindfolded and taken into an airport, if I didn't see the whole aerial diagram to know, was, did I go through a centralized area and then am I fanning out to, to fingers? Is that a multiple terminal or a single terminal? Well, I, I don't know. So I, I, I just make that request of the group. Just yeah. Real quick along, so I was, that brings back to my original comments, right? Because I don't know if there really is such a thing as a single terminal airport that exists, right? So I, I agree with that. And I, I went back to the mission statement as we were talking this morning and thinking back on that. And, you know, our key, some of the key words in our mission statement is the optimal configuration. And I also see, in, in, and I guess this is a little bit of a question topic for discussion, do we also have a decision separately from that, right? The If the optimal configuration means building something new, right? If we fix what we have, the assumed configuration is what we have. If um, there is, then there's another decision, okay, if we're not going to fix what we have, then there's the optimal configuration, right? But there's almost a little bit of a fix or maintain versus build decision that may be separate from that, uh, correct? And so I'm just kind of, as we get further into this, optimal configuration in our mission statement was, was very appropriate. Now I'm realizing maybe there's another decision on top of that. Are we building a new structure? And then that's one decision. Are we going to build a new structure? And then with the new structure decision, then what's the right optimal configuration yes. for the structure? Okay. Great. John? Mr. Chair, I, I agree with your comments. I, I would just ask that your message also be delivered to the Aviation Department. I think it doesn't help this group to be objective in its discussions and its plannings and recommendations if we have another message coming out saying, well, 
it is a single terminal that we want. It is going to cost $1.2 billion. So I, I would just ask you to, uh, to deliver that message, but I, but I do agree with uh, what you're asking of the group. John, uh, that's, a good, that's a good comment, and uh, generally speaking, I would suggest that for the most part they have gotten off of that message. And you'll notice on the tour you didn't hear that. Uh, and and uh, when I've heard them reacting to questions in public, that has no longer been the case. That was at one point a very good uh, point in that regard. And <laughs> I would have to say, Paula, had we known what the complexity of answering that question, optimum configuration, you know, I might have declined this. <laughs> but here we are. So now we're all kind of stuck with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now we're all in this boat together. <laughs> Alicia. Maybe this is um, the best time for me to share one of my frustrations. And um, because we hear the different terminology and um, even, uh, I just feel like sometimes there's misinformation out there. And we certainly have had the benefit of learning um, some of the, the facts about that. And so I feel one of our roles and responsibilities is that when we hear that misinformation, such as um, don't spend the money there, spend the money someplace else, we all know around this table you can't spend aviation dollars someplace else. So I feel like one of our responsibilities is to make certain that the misinformation, whether it's single terminal, multiple terminal, terminal or where the money's coming from, it's partially our responsibility to make certain that um, that kind of education um, is shared with, with as many folks as we can. That's a really important comment, and it's one of the reasons we are so uh, focused on getting this electronic community conversation started, because there is, we're struck, all, I know all of you are struck all the time by the amount of misinformation and how attached people can be to an uninformed position. I, and Dave and I have exchanged more than once emails from friends who will send us a, one or two or three remarks and then add the phrase, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> uh, to hear that out of the mouths of, you can fill in the blank with almost any category. Um, so it's a key issue and we hope to gradually inform the community through this dialogue and we think part of our collective jobs once we get to the discourse is to address that. I mean, part of this is educating ourselves and in turn educating the larger community. So hopefully we'll find a way to do that. Thanks. Okay. Um, having said that, I'd like to move to uh, uh, our next area, and that is uh, what, is, what does our, our kind of first brush look like around identifying uh, some of the, the uh, prioritizing and some of the key performance indicators. And so uh, we, we've passed that out and uh, I want to throw a couple of caveats. Um, when we kind of had to uh, put pencils down on this, we had not yet received every single response from everybody. So, um, it is still preliminary. We're still getting uh, a little bit of feedback uh, from some of you in, um, but in order to prepare for this meeting, we had to kind of stop and, and, and summarize things. And, and so uh, view this as a first blush. Um, these are not our final conclusions. These are just indicators of direction. So I want to caution any of us and those of you in, in, the, in the audience, these are not our conclusions. So please don't interpret them as such. It's just kind of the first, first thoughts. Uh, we don't have all the facts yet. So this is, uh, uh, in, in some degree, we need to be very cautious that without all the facts, these are some thoughts. These, they may change once we start getting into these areas. But the whole aspect of, of uh, unbundling these key six columns was to give us an opportunity to kind of separate apples from oranges and just look at all the oranges at one time. 
And, and so what I want to do is, is uh, just briefly walk through this, our responses. Uh, there's not time today to have extensive discussion on any one particular line or any one particular column. I just want to share with you what the what kind of looks like and then give you some observations because I've had a lot of time to, to study this, having looked over all the responses, looked at the, the tabulation, looked at the weighting, looked at the relative weighting, and, and this is how it came out. Um, and, and so uh, if there is an H, it was clearly the highest scored item, most frequently chosen, and, and uh, not only a number, but also in weighting. And where there was, uh, where there was an, an M indicated for medium, that means it might have been a close second, or there was clearly uh, uh, a, a real preference to even a medium in relation to other areas. And, and so um, if there's only one M, for example, that means that everything else was pretty well evenly dispersed and nothing really distinguished itself. And so we really tended to really want to look at, uh, because this is just directional and not any final answer, this just gives us uh, a feel, uh, a prism into uh, what's really, how we really felt important. And then uh, when you look at how these are grouped, um, in, if you look at vertical then, you can see what areas seem to have the collection of the most highs. So um, if, I, if I made a couple observations before we get into detail, um, it was the most of the, the highest scores where there was consensus uh, was in the column that related to convenience. So it, it, uh, the group felt that uh, when you looked at a particular key performance indicator um, on the, on the left-hand side, when you went across uh, looking at what areas it impacted the most or what were most important, it came in the column of convenience. Uh, it had the highest scores uh, of any particular line uh, where there was a lot of consensus and also the most H's when you look at it. So convenience is obviously going to figure uh, really high as being a real qualitative aspect of, the, of any, anything we talk about. It's also interesting to note um, that in almost every case where convenience was the highest rated area, a close second or the next highest was adaptability. And, and I thought that was a, a real significant observation uh, of the committee. Uh, there, there are many, many places where there was an H, uh, but also adaptability was important. And that's gonna, be, that's gonna be telling, I think, as we go through our future deliberations. Um, and, and so I think that when you look at relative to convenience, but also the highest number of scores, that's where adaptability came in. And another observation, in, in nearly every case where it mattered, where it might have come into play, that convenience was rated more importantly than security. So we apparently don't care whether we live or not, but we just, <laughs> as, long as, we, as long as our convenience is there. Um, I guess that's the only time we have to worry about it. But the, uh, except in, in the one case where we got into uh, actual number 20 security checkpoints, um, we got a little more excited uh, about security, but still convenience was a close second. And, and so that, that really gives us uh, a, a good insight into uh, uh, how we look at this. So I, I wanted just to, uh, I'll just briefly run through each line and then uh, you can maybe make some notes um, and, and then we can uh, talk about next steps in this as how we roll this out. So the first line, air, airline ticket prices, um, it, that was overwhelmingly rated 
uh, affordability the highest. Uh, there wasn't even anything close to that. Uh, with, but there was a medium for business and adaptability um, that, that came in following affordability. Um, airline use and lease agreements, um, the, the group pretty much felt inclined to rate business generation slightly uh, ahead of affordability. Under airport user fees, um, you can see affordability uh, was uh, uh, rated higher over business generation, and, th and that, was, that was significant. Um, uh, that was a, a big disparity between the two, but business creation was, was definitely a second. On the city gateway image, the first impression, um, that was, uh, no surprise, closely tied to business generation. Um, er everybody felt that that would have uh, the greatest impact uh, depending on the, uh, the, the, the first impression for visitors. Um, no surprise, number five, the cost uh, was closely aligned with affordability. Um, curbside amenities, convenience rated uh, very high with medium for adaptability. Environmental number seven uh, was consistently the leading driver with secondary consideration given adaptability uh, going along with the discussion we had uh, earlier this morning. Um, eight, financial options, uh, no surprise there, is, is highly impacting uh, affordability. Nine, the impact on the Kansas City bond capacity. Um, there's the perception with our group to be yet to be proved at a fu future meeting or, or verified that any airport capital improvements funded by debt uh, may have some impact on Kansas City bond capacity. Um, that, that's not a conclusion of this group. We'll, it remains to be seen, but that'll be something that we will want to inquire about. Uh, Ten, luggage handling at all points. Um, convenience was highly favored over, over medium adaptability and security. No, no, no question there. The convenience was the, uh, uh, the favored factor. <coughs> Eleven, we get into all the nonstop flight options and international destinations we talked about and coverage of the top 50 markets. Um, more flight options really perceived to be best for business generation over medium rated convenience. So business was really looked at there as uh, uh, having the most potential impact. Parking, parking was seen first and foremost to be the best for business generation over medium rated convenience. And I think many of you answered that from the standpoint of uh, that, that parking revenue uh, is a big driver for the uh, revenue plan for the airports. It's with the highest revenue line item um, and, and may have had um, some, some affiliation there. Passenger employment headcount uh, was seen as a uh, uh, key driver of affordability over medium business generation. Passenger check-in process Again, convenience was a top consideration by far over medium consideration for security and adaptability. Passenger waiting areas, electrical outlets, Wi-Fi, again, consideration uh, for convenience is the highest, uh, and then followed by medium adaptability. Population demographic and shifts, um, you can see there that the uh, adaptability is a key consideration uh, when, when looking at the population demographics well ahead of uh, medium business generation. Regional jet coverage, uh, you can see that uh, it's primarily driven by business generation with medium consideration given to affordability and convenience. Restrooms overwhelmingly rated top convenience uh, with adapt adaptability as a medium consideration. So we want restrooms uh, fast, where we need them, and uh, well, you know, and then uh, give consideration for adaptability. Retail amenities seen first as a convenience, 
rather than uh, first as a business generation, but business generation was, a, was second. Security checkpoints, um, uh, security was the top driver. And then walking distance uh, was overwhelmingly given top consideration as a convenience with medium consideration equally split between adaptability and security. So when, when you look at uh, overall uh, conclusions, as I said, it really, it comes, it comes down to uh, uh, convenience and affordability and business creation, uh, where the three areas that receive the most high responses. That, so that, that tells us maybe a little bit of a direction on where we need to do additional exploration and try to find the balance between affordability and making sure we have appropriate conveniences to deal with the usage, but with a mind and eye toward business creation. It's not a surprise, but when you look at it, when you kind of tabulate it, that this will help us put the apples and oranges in different baskets. And, and so I'll stop there for a minute just to get reactions to the overall uh, observations that I've made. Any surprises? Uh, oh, you know, I, I think on the security thing, <clears throat> and I didn't check that high in, but in very few places, but I assumed, and maybe it's a wrong assumption, that once we do whatever we're going to do up there, the place is going to be more secure throughout from all of these categories and when you, especially when we check in, that security is going to be, you know, maybe in, well, however that works, but that the airport is secure, period, once we leave our, well, once we pull into the airport for the parking lot uh, or curbside, that security is enhanced to a higher degree than it is today. So. I think that's a fair, that's a fair assumption that, that the, the, the FAA is going to make sure that whatever we come up with is going to be secure, no doubt about it. Everybody's going to be issued their own German Shepherd when they... security thing as much maybe deeply as maybe I should have thought about it. Yeah. And, and I think Bill brings up uh, an important point, um, and that is we, we all did make assumptions when we filled this out. And I, frankly, I was a little worried about that. but. The encouraging and so I was pretty much in your category, Bill. I thought, well, security is mandatory. I don't have to evaluate. I have to give it high, medium, low. It's <clears> mandatory. <throat> so I just sort of, I went for convenience. I was one of those convenience freaks. Uh, but I think that applies almost to every line item on here. And the comforting thing for me was to see this in aggregate. It clearly does lead us in a direction of our collective highest concerns. And so another example is some of us had five or six L's for low on this, and some of us chose not to put any, right? But in aggregate, it all that falls out, and we get a fairly clear picture of how we collect, what we collectively think are the most important issues. And I think that really does inform us as a group about where we need more information in order to make an informed recommendation. Um, and I think it applies to both, both these indicators and the ones that Dave is, has yet to cover. But uh, for me, uh, you investing the time to do this really helps us see a pattern of what is the way forward. Yeah. I just wanted to, to add to Bill's point, one of the, it didn't come up in our overview of the tour, but talking with the maintenance folks afterwards, and I would also echo how hard they work, for them, the security piece is a big deal, and, and it impacts their ability to get the work done. And they are envisioning that that's going to continue to be a bigger piece of their responsibility in terms of workarounds or putting up. And even at New Terminal, we saw where they wanted to go higher to avoid people throwing things over. So I just, it's something that we need to, th so even as we look at these final three pillars around which we're going to structure the rest. It just seems to me we still need to use the security piece as a touchstone because I think it informs 
sort of what's happening in the current space and what we need to anticipate in whatever new space we look at. And one thing we didn't cover in the early airport observations, but it was on my larger list relative to security, is right now there's almost no resilience in the equipment side of the security system. Right. So if that high-tech holding room and a baggage investigation area goes down, the airlines that it is served by essentially have to st cancel flights because there's no there's no backup system next to it. Um, and so clearly that gets way bumped up on the security list. How do we create resilience and adaptability with whatever the improvements are? Did you have something over here? Okay. Over here. Oh. I, I guess I go back to the security thing too, like Bill, and all of us do this with a different mindset. But I think no one likes convenience any more than I do. I love convenience in all, in all of these areas. But I think all of us want a secure airport. Security is, you know, in, probably on my list, security was almost H's all the, you know, in almost everything. Because I do think that is just very important for our city, for our region, and for us to provide that for our citizens is, is security. So everybody does kind of go into it with a, a different, you know, uh, mindset. But uh, I would agree with uh, Bill. And so to make that point uh, real clear, um, what we don't want to have happen is that anybody perceives that because we didn't put an H in security for every line that, that we don't have an I to that. I think that, I think what we're saying is uh, we, want, we want to acknowledge that of course we want a safe and secure airport and, and having said that, then let's get into all these other areas. So that's, that's the overriding message, yes. I think this um, first blush of the, of the indicators paints a really good picture of the base of why the discussion even started. What was built 40 years ago for convenience and for ease is, has to be different than what it is now. We assume security, um, security is mandated, we know it has to be there, and therein lies the disconnect between convenience, which we all love, um, but we have to have this, we're mandated to have the security piece, and I think that is one of the main conversations here, is that do we have to give up the convenience in order to keep it secure? Can I just comment on that? I'm, I'm sure most folks are aware there is a TSA pre-check program. I'm sure many of you have <coughs> TSA pre-check. Kansas City International is actually one of the least convenient airports because you cannot go through TSA pre-check. They don't have the ability to allow you to do that. I can get through the line at Chicago O'Hare much quicker than Kansas City. I don't, have to take, I don't have to take my clothes off, don't have to take bags off. Everything goes, <laughs> you go right through the metal detector. We can't do that because we don't have a centralized security facility. Let's make sure we capture that point when, when we get to security, and, and, and uh, we'll certainly delve into that. That's a good good point. There, there was a comment, David, just to update you. Did you join the tour? Were you on the tour? I was not on the tour. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. because there was a comment, and I can't remember what context this was in, but it was toward the end of the tour, and they were talking about some of the things that they wanted to do. And one item that was mentioned is that they are currently looking for room for the TSA pre-check. So that is on their initiative list, whether we, I think, pursue anything with the airport or not, but certainly that's a configuration consideration, but that's something they're looking to do even in advance of what they decide to do with the airport. That's well, on their My list. recollection was that the struggle there was that they were already widening Space. security so much that it was hard to figure out how to dedicate more width to the lane for it. I have been witness to someone not from Kansas City get into a verbal altercation with TSA about where the TS where this checkpoint line was. He got kind of close, but uh, it was very interesting. I just thought it's an interesting point that I hear a lot about convenience, and people say KCI is so convenient. There are certainly convenient aspects. As a frequent traveler, it's not terribly convenient relative to other airports. So we should note that. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're, we're about out of time. I want to kind of finish up today the observations um, and, uh, 
and talk about next steps and how we intend to go through this process uh, with your input. Um, the, the final preliminary observation I had by looking at just these sheets is that the, uh, when we start talking about stakeholders, which we'll uh, share those results at an upcoming meeting, uh, the stakeholder rankings was, were not intended to determine who's the highest stakeholder, but rather to help us identify as many stakeholders as possible that would be uh, impacted or have input into uh, some of these some of these areas. And uh, when, when we looked at, um, I, I took a peek under the under the covers uh, on that, and and I found that when we everybody identified stakeholders, that the uh, two groups uh, kind of emerged, uh, and that the the business community um, was seen a, as the biggest stakeholder in business creation. Well, that is no no surprise. And when, when I so when I I say the business community. That's, that's pretty broad, but th those conducting business here, companies and, uh, and the like that rely on uh, the airport in one degree or another um, had the biggest stakeholder mentioned the most. Uh, there are many other groups that would be also mentioned under the business creation column. Um, not, not every stakeholder, but certainly um, following uh, the business community, uh, those mentioned the most, would, would include, and we'll have a synopsis of this at a future meeting, I'm just sharing this with you orally, that the work, workforce development, the retail vendors, the hospitality travel industry, the airlines themselves, the cities, transportation vendors, national elected officials, city council, all of those were indicated as stakeholders. And then the, 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 another group that emerged um, as the biggest stakeholders in convenience, which is where we had most of the other H's, uh, were the, the citizens who live here and the, the out-of-town passengers that use the airport. Um, no surprise there that they had a high stake in convenience, most vocal. Um, and, and, and so when we, when we get into having a meeting or a discussion around a particular vertical column, we'll make sure that we involve the stakeholders that are impacted or will impact that column in the discussion. And, and so by filling out the spreadsheet we had, we now have a good indication who those stakeholders are and, and where, they, where they rank in terms of uh, the greatest impact. And that's what we took away from uh, the other stakeholder side. So we, we will make sure that we uh, touch all the stakeholders that we need to in a particular area. But it, it, uh, it, it clearly will uh, uh, come, come down in a lot of aspects to what's the ROI, what does a business community need in order to run our economy, and still measure uh, some some level of convenience, keep an eye toward adaptability. So when you think about it that way, our, our task is fairly easy. So I, we'll have one more meeting maybe and try to wrap up. So I think that'll be, that'll be good. <coughs> so I think that, that really uh, concludes our prepared remarks. You all were really helpful with your suggestions today. We, we thank you for, for being here. And uh, uh, I think we're going to have uh, our upcoming meeting, uh, our next meeting, uh, we'll hopefully delve into, just as an example of how to look at it, uh, we will we'll go into what was the analysis for uh, what the airport aviation department uh, advanced as their solution. Um, so we're going to talk about that at our next meeting, and uh, I'm trying to talk about that without using the term single terminal. <laughs> but um, we'll, or we'll point, see. Or 1.2 billion price tag. Yes, right, right. So we're, we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into uh, the plan that was advanced, and hopefully we will learn about 
what were the costs of some of the areas, and what's an example format on how it was analyzed, how, how a major renovation is analyzed, what, what's the impact to historical revenue by line, what, what's, the, what's the capital expenditure to fund certain things. Um, and, and we're going to learn about that today, or at the next meeting, and, and then use that for future discussion just as a comparable benchmark. So we're not saying that's the only plan we're going to look at, but that's the one that's currently been developed the furthest. And so we're going to just look at that one with an objective eye. Bob? Uh, any other questions uh, before we go? And I might ask Jay to give us some information about parking. Um, we talked about, yeah. Uh, just, just as a reminder, the parking garage is across the street. It's the Oak Street garage. Um, if you can. Uh, if you can park there, grab your ticket. The uh, um, just for the commissioners on the on the board. The green ticket. Enter your ticket first. Enter the green ticket and behind it. Uh, it's not. It's a duplicate system, so it, it'll actually let you out that way. And the garages are open uh, early, so uh, as early as you want to get in, you can you can make it into these. And do you all have a green ticket? Not yet. I'll finish <laughs> passing them out here in a second. And you were considering having them park here. Did that? Is that not? Uh, we were considering it, but uh, it's actually not going to work out. The garage is not manned that early in the morning, um, and the, they would need to have a, a door uh, access code. Um. Well, again, so get your green tickets from Jay before you leave, and thanks again for uh, your thoughtful uh, input. And uh, I think Dave and I are both optimistic. While this is complicated and taking longer than we would have hoped, we feel really good about uh, what you've done and what we'll be able to do. Thanks.